Uh, well, good evening. Thank you very much for joining with us this evening for our midweek Bible study. Uh, one or two little announcements I'll give you first of all. Uh, just following or shortly after this Bible study at a quarter past eight, this is Wednesday evening of course, quarter past eight is our Zoom prayer meeting. You'll need sign-in details, they're just the normal details. If you have them, you'll know how to get in. If you don't have them, uh, make contact with me and you can come and join with us at the prayer meeting. Sundays, we're still continuing with our drive-in service at 11 a.m. down at Portland Owen Marina. And you're very welcome. We just have two or three of those left and then we'll be moving inside. And we'll give you details about what we're going to do about moving back inside. We're hoping to do that soon back into our church building. And of course, on Sundays also, we're still online at 12 noon and the plan is to continue doing that. So as if you're not able to join with us, you'll still be able to get us online. We're also starting in just now properly to our youth and children's work. Uh, our children's uh, online video for the week is now online here and you can link into that. And uh, also there's other work going on which you'll hear about. You get packs in your house and so on. Uh, Christmas shoe boxes, we keep reminding you about those. This is the time now to do them and to get them into us before the end of October. But I think you'll probably know the details about that. Uh, those are all the things that I want to say by way of announcement. Uh, but uh, let me read to you Oh, what we're going to do now in the month of October. God willing, we're going to look in these four Wednesday evenings of October at the first four Psalms. And so let me read to you Psalm 1. First Psalm. And so the psalmist says, Psalm number 1 and verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We thank God for his living word. Let's pray just for a moment before we come to this word to think about it. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for your precious word. And Lord, we draw near to you now and ask that you would come and minister to us by your Holy Spirit, that we may hear the voice of God. Lord, that we may see things in your word that we've not seen before because you do that for us over and over again. But Lord, that you would bring to us the great truths of your word and that you would minister to us individually as we wait upon you now quietly in your word. For we ask it in the Saviour's precious name. Amen. And so it's always useful if you can have your Bible open there at uh, the first psalm. And... Uh, the Psalms, what do you think of the Psalms? Oh, so many people say, I love the Psalms. Many people say to me, aren't the Psalms great? The Psalms are great. But then listen, the whole of the Bible is great. This is an amazing book. Isn't it just marvelous that we have the Word of God written for us in our own language? Isn't it incredible and just brilliant? And this book of Psalms, right in the middle of it, absolutely amazing and yet there's something we need to be careful about in the book of Psalms and particularly in relation to the promises in the book of Psalms because you see many people treat it as if every comfort and every promise and every assurance in the book of Psalms and indeed in the Bible applies to everyone who reads them and who chooses to take them to themselves and you know that's a bit like me holding a check, a written check in my hand and saying this check is mine. But you know, it's only mine if my name is on it. I can hold it, I can read it, I can delight in it if it's a great big amount of money. I can even feel that I'm claiming it for myself 
but if it doesn't have my name on it, then I can't cash it in. And you see, the Psalms are the book, the songbook for God's people, for his own redeemed people. Other people may read the Psalms and they do. They may delight in the Psalms and many people who don't know the Lord delight in things that are written in the Psalms. They may even feel that they claim the Psalms for themselves, but they can't cash them in. Psalm 1, this first Psalm, is setting the scene for us in the whole of the book of Psalms and reminding us because as we go through the book of Psalms, we'll discover there are so many ups and downs. There are so many terrors and joys. There's so much sadness and ecstasy, just like real life, you see. And I wonder where you're at, just as we're coming to this Psalm this morning, I wonder where you're at in your personal experience, because we do have many turns in life's journey. And you may be in a very low place this morning, or you may be in a marvelous place. But wherever you are at today, the Psalms have a place for you to come and rest. The Psalms have a word directly for you. The Psalms straight from God have a power for your situation, just wherever you're at today. But with all these ups and downs in life, with all these turns in life's pathway, at the end of the day, and this is where Psalm 1 is homing in for us, at the end of the day, there are only two roads really. There are only two groups of people. There are those who are clothed in the righteousness of God and who are pleasing in the presence of God. And there are those still guilty sinners who are separated from God and alienated from God. And this, the psalm here is, is clear about it and Jesus was crystal clear about it that there are these two and there is no middle ground. There are the redeemed who can claim all the great promises of God's word and the great promises of these psalms. And there are those who are not yet saved who can't claim any of that, truly. Uh, psalm 23 is probably the one that we know best and the one that most people who don't know the Lord cling to. Uh, and it illustrates the point very well because the psalmist says at the beginning of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And then goes on to say these most marvellous things about life and even about the valley of death. But everything hinges on what he says in the opening breath of the psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. And there are only two groups of people on earth. Those who are the Lord's, who have come to the Lord and put their lives in his hands. And those who are not yet. And this is what Psalm 1 is setting out for us at the very beginning of the book of Psalms. And so we see the two groups of people. Uh, there, there is the, the righteous man or the righteous woman. Psalm 1 and verses 1 to 3, it says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. What a brilliant first word for the book of Psalms. Do you see it? The word blessed. It means happy. It means richly happy. What a beautiful word. What a significant word. What an important first word for the book of Psalms. And at the very outset, the Lord is saying to us, you're searching, you're searching for happiness, for blessing, for purpose, for meaning in life. Everybody that's got any sense is doing that. And the Lord's saying to us, right, well, listen here, because here I'll tell you the sort of person who is blessed, the sort of person who has true happiness, that truly fulfills the word happiness. And so see what sort of a person this is. See what the path of his life is. Verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners. Verse 6, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. And this sense of walking here, the path that he's on in life. And the psalmist is telling us this is someone who doesn't take his advice or his direction or his example from the wicked. The wicked? 
Who are that? Well, the wicked. It's the broad road that leads to destruction. And there's the obvious wicked and evil advice, which we can spot a mile off. But also, you see, there's the respectable wicked and evil advice. It's sometimes even preached from pulpits, I have to say. Live a decent life. Do nobody any harm. And everything will be absolutely fine. But you see, that is godless advice. That is the counsel of the wicked. That is the word of people who are deluded into a false sense of security. Make sure that that's not you. And in a sense, probably all of us, or at least most of us, were in that position at a time where we were listening to the wrong advice. We were listening to another gospel. And so verse 1, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. He doesn't make a mockery of serious things. Sin, eternity, hell, judgment, God. Someone here who has a deep reverence for God and a constant awareness of a coming judgment day. He's not never mocking about these things. You see, see it Spurgeon said that the, the seat of the mocker may be very lofty, but it is also very near to the gate of hell. And yet you know that we live in a world today where spiritual things, where the deepest things are treated often with mockery. We see it on our television screens frequently and we can, we've watched the progress of that. And indeed we see here a progression in uh, verse 1. Watch the, you see the verbs in verse 1. It says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the mocker. And you have the, the, the picture there of a downward progression where someone is first of all just walking through the evil territory, just walking through, but then begins to stand there and to almost enjoy this, to at least watch it, to look at it, to stop with it. But then who actually sits down and makes this their place where they stay. And I think we can watch that progress in our world even as we watch the level on which TV has operated and the level on which people operate in the world, where there was a, a kind of a dabbling in all these things and then a stopping there uh, and then a sitting there. But we can see it also in the lives of individuals. And so the path of his life, um, are you listening to the right advice? Secondly, his priorities. Verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Where does this righteous person find his greatest joy and fulfillment? What takes up his time? Where do his priorities lay? lie? Listen to verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The righteous person, that is the one who has been made righteous in Christ, finds his great delight in the scriptures. And the psalmist's greatest joy was to linger in the scriptures. Verse 2 again, he says, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now remember this, when the psalmist wrote that, he only had the first five books of the Bible. And here we are, and we've got so much more. We have got the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, where we can see the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection. We see his miracles. We, uh, we, we hear his parables. We have the New Testament letters set out for us. We have the book of Revelation where we get a very glimpse into heaven. And we have... We have the Psalms, the book of Psalms, which the psalmist didn't have when he set out to begin writing the book of Psalms. We have the marvelous prophecy of Isaiah. And oh, we have such a, a brilliant book before us, a marvelous book, a lovely book. Do we delight in it? 
Is it a priceless treasure to us? Is it our great joy? Verse 2 again, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on His law He meditates day and night. Is the Scripture our priceless treasure? Are we in it day and night? Not just reading it, but pondering it, thinking about it, praying it through, learning it off. In every situation, turning our minds immediately to the precious answers that God has in his word and the priceless promises and the unerring guidance. Do we love the Bible? Is that our priority, folks? Or are we making excuses for ourselves? The psalmist didn't have any Bible reading notes. And he only had Genesis to Deuteronomy, and yet he loved the Scriptures. Do we love the Scriptures? Is that our priority? The product also of his life, his path, his priorities, his product. Look at verse 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. I love how it says there, not he is a tree growing by streams of water, but he is a tree planted. It's a richer picture here, a tree planted by the streams of water, not a wild tree that happens to be growing there because the seed fell there, but a tree that has been chosen and planted and cultivated by the mighty hand of God. This Isaiah over in Isaiah chapter 43, and the Lord says there, this is what the Lord says, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. And this tremendous sense of us being the Lord's that he has put us here. And that's what's in here when it says he is like a tree planted by the streams of water. The streams of water, this endless supply of life. This well that will never run dry, rooted in Jesus. Can you say this morning, I'm this evening rather, I'm rooted in Jesus. Jesus says, in his, uh, uh, well, over in God's word in the Old Testament, first of all, in Isaiah 55, it says, Oh, everyone who is thirsty, come to the waters. But Jesus says very specifically uh, on a number of occasions, for example, in John chapter 7, and Jesus says there on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within us. With him. And on another occasion in John chapter 4, speaking to the woman of the well, he said, whoever drinks this water of the well will thirst again, but whoever drinks the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but it will become in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. There is a river, says Jesus, that flows from deep within, that when we know him as our Savior, there's this great fountain that he has placed within us. Are we drinking every day? Is Jesus Christ a well within us? And if so, you see, there'll be results, there'll be evidence, there'll be an outcome. Verse 3, he is like a, like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in the season and whose leaf does not does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. And you notice how here the psalmist and in God's word speaks about the fruit before he speaks about the leaf. And indeed he speaks about the root. First of all, there is the order that first of all we must be rooted in Christ. But then you see the leaf is how the tree describes itself. And that's secondary. The important thing is what does the tree produce? What does it have to show? What is the fruit? And you see, we may describe ourselves as Christians and that's the leaf and it's good and it's good to have a testimony that we can give, but people want to see the fruit in Jesus Christ. And so is there product in our life? Is there eternal product, folks, in our life? There it is, whatever he does, the end of that verse 3, whatever he does prospers. So what a marvellous, lovely picture of the one who knows the Lord. But then, and I'll deal with this one more 
briefly, the wicked man, the other side, what a contrast we see now when we read verse 4, where it says, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the, in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. What a contrast. You see the godly, like a tree planted by streams of water, bearing fruit, prospering, solid, secure, unshakable, worthwhile, pleasing. And now suddenly we read verse 4, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. And you see there a picture of danger first and foremost. Unlike the, 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 uh, unlike the wheat, the chaff is unstable. It is insecure. It is blown about by every blast of wind, never to be gathered again. You don't gather the chaff up again. It's, it's no use for anything. You see the tree planted by the stream, standing firm and immovable through every storm and every drought because it's planted by the stream. And then you see the chaff that is blown asunder by every little breeze that comes along. And there's the difference between the one who is grounded in Jesus Christ and the one who is not, because the one is on a solid rock and the other is on the sinking sand. Jesus told a very explicit parable about that, building your house on the rock and building your house on the sand. Where have you built your house? How is it for you when the storms of life come and ultimately when the storm of death comes? Oh, what a difference for us believers in Christ. We talk about being saved because that's the word Jesus used. And it's a lovely word, but also the word that goes along with it is safe. Because when we're saved, we're safe. And you see, being outside of Christ, it's a picture of danger here. It's also a picture of deadness in verse 4. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Unlike the tree, the chaff is dead, it is worthless, it is useless. Uh, some of you are older will remember the thresher, or nowadays it's the combine harvester, and then there are three things, three byproducts. The first is the grain that is used for food, and it's precious. Then there's the straw that can be used for bedding and sometimes even for fodder, but the chaff. It is only fit to be burned. It's a nuisance. It stings the eyes. It is disposed of and destroyed as quickly as possible. And there's what the scripture uses as a picture for the person without Christ. Of what lasting worth is that person's life? How frail and temporary everything he or she has is passing away. Just like chaff that's going to blow away. And yet we who are in Christ. We have life and we have everlasting life. It's a picture of danger. It's a picture of deadness. It's also a picture of destruction. Verse 5. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Now, the wicked will stand for trial. Jesus says very plainly about how we'll be called to account for everything even that we've spoken. And the wicked will stand in trial, but will not be able to stand in judgment. Once judgment is pronounced, the one who is not in Christ will no longer stand. It will be a terrible moment. It will be a fearsome moment. Oh, make sure that you're never in that situation. That you never reach the end of your life and then discover, yes, there is a judgment. And then discover that you're not ready and that you cannot stand because you haven't a leg to stand on. But oh, we who know the Lord, how good it's going to be for us on that judgment day to discover that we're standing on the rock, that Jesus has paid for us. And you know, there are the two very different pictures. And yet the two are growing together. Jesus told the parable about that, about the, the wheat and the weeds growing together for now. The last verse sets out for us and emphasizes for us at the end of the psalm the final and ultimate contrast verse 6 for the lord watches over the way of the righteous 
but the way of the wicked will perish. And the summary of it all is simply this, that there are two roads which often run together here on earth, but one day they will part, never to meet again. One to an eternity and glory at the throne of God and the Lamb among the vast company of the redeemed, free forever from sorrow and death and pain. If you're watching and on Sunday you have seen us in Revelation 21 and all those things that are gone forever. And that's where the one path is leading to. And the other path is leading to eternal destruction and torment. Make sure you're on the right path because there are only two types of people in the world. But what a difference in those two types. The saved man, in a sense, carves his name on the rock, the great eternal rock. The unsaved man or woman writes their name in the sand. The saved person ploughs the earth and sows a crop that grows into an eternal harvest. The unsaved person ploughs the sea often leaving behind a beautiful shining trail, but that will soon vanish and be forgotten for all of eternity. And so the psalmist says in Psalm 103 and verse 6 about this man, As for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower in the field, the wind blows over and that, that it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. My, what a crystal clear picture. What a mighty picture. What a solemn picture for us here in the Word of God, introducing us to the book of Psalms and saying, let us be crystal clear as Jesus was constantly in his preaching. Crystal clear that there are just two ways and you're either in the one or the other. You've either built your life on the rock and you belong to Christ this, this evening as someone who is saved and safe for eternity or else you're, you're building your life on the sand and a day is coming very shortly when everything will blow away and worse than that we'll enter the terrible torment. And so what a message, what a crystal clear message, what a comfort for those of us who are in Christ, who are safe tonight, not because of anything we have done, but all because of what he has done and we are his. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for how you've, so many of us, we can say you've called us out of darkness into light and we are safe. Oh, Lord, help us all as we examine our lives tonight to make sure we're in the right place. And for those of us who are, to be delighted tonight. And for those of us who aren't, even tonight, to come to Christ. For we ask it in his precious name. Amen. So I remind you, our Zoom prayer meeting will be going live now at a quarter past eight. And we hope you'll be able to join us there.